News Talk 98.9, the roar of Memphis. Tool Talk Radio with Joe and Alan. Welcome to Tool Talk Radio, coming to you from the Brown Refrigeration Studios. I'm Joe Thorderson with Thor's Hammer, Carpentry and Wood Turning. And I'm Alan Gilbreth with DarkOakMedia.com. And I'm Maximilian. Let's see where I'm behind today. Okay. <laughs> it really throws me when he, gets, when he gets creative. You can call or text us at the Big M Roofing and Remodeling Hotline at 901-683-0989. And, uh, of course, we invite you to go to the Tool Talk Radio Facebook page, which is Tool Talk Radio, right, Alan? That's ToolTalkRadio.com. Pretty straightforward. Is that how it, wait, oh, that's that's the website. Mm-hmm. Okay. Hey, Alan, I was remiss. Let's just get some housekeeping out of the way, and we're going to have to reiterate this. Um, you can leave us, you know, you can call during the show. Absolutely. I was under the impression that you could leave a voice message any time of the day, but that's not true. <gasps> oh, You can leave okay. a text any time of the day. And uh, we'll be giving a, you know, we'll, 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 we'll let you know how you get in touch with us. Because, uh, Alan, we got a voice message from somebody, uh, from a listener. They actually mm-hmm. called my number. I, you know, I do give out my phone number on the, on the show. And um, she was interested in learning something. And uh, we've decided, Alan, that um, uh, among other things, in the, as, as Tool Talk Radio evolves, one thing we want to make clear is our listener requests come first. Oh, yes. If they propose something fascinating, that goes to the top of the pile in terms of uh, show content. So what she was interested in, uh, well, I'm not going to say we're going to... Uh, we're going to play her message You're going to leave in a minute. That as a so tease. That's a tease. However, what that does mean, Alan, you and I were discussing this in our exhaustive show prep. We're going to start shaking things up a little because you mm. and I have segments that we want to start bringing to the table. So, folks, you may be getting a, a little variety in in the way you there know. We go. You can't miss an episode. You can't miss anything. You know, a moment of Tool Talk Radio. Oh, you so. can, <laughs> um, Alan. So, I have a heartwarming later in the show. I have a heartwarming story about a pallet. Involving the youth of today. Mm, okay. And, I'm, and I'm also, excited about that. It's back to school time. And especially, you know, this has become sort of an annual tradition for you and I. When you send your college student back to school, mm. uh, don't forget to send them off with some tools. They, they, you know, they're moving. Even if a dorm is still a home, there's things that, you know. There, oh, there's, that's more than a home. Joe. You and I have it sort of a checklist. <laughs> yeah. We have uh, an interesting must-have item of the week. But, Alan, um which uh, I'm just going to go ahead and, and take ownership of this. Uh, our great moments in building history is now officially my favorite part of the show. Right. I really awesome. have grown to like it. And uh, this week, you're bringing us something. I am. Okay. You going to tell us what it is or no? I'm going to reach back into ancient Mesopotamia to bring you a little tidbit. Okay. All right. So Alan doesn't like to tease as, as mm. much as I do. So anyway, um, but it's going to be pretty epic, and it's things you can still observe today. Yes. Everywhere. Everywhere. Literally everywhere. You in, you can interact with this uh, particular this particular feature. Yes. So all right. I can't get the information out of Alan. He'll just we'll, you'll just have to wait <laughs> till the bottom uh, to the top of the next hour. So that's right. All right, Alan. Uh, so, Max, today we're shaking things up a little. Like I said, in lieu of doing our salute, we are gonna um, we're gonna listen. Uh, sorry, we're gonna uh, <laughs> highlight a listener request that came in because it's actually a really fascinating topic. Oh, Max, are you gonna play the voice message? Okay, we well, did get a voice message. Uh, that's what I've been waiting for, at Max. He's looking uh, at there Yeah, it is. this is Becky. I'm calling from Memphis. I'm a big fan of your show. Um, I went to college in the Chicago suburbs and have always been intrigued by the Marina Tower. So, um, if you could enlighten me about that, I would be uh, very happy. Uh, thanks, bye. Okay. Now, I know the audio was choppy on that, but uh, if folks, if you don't know, so that's one of our listeners, Becky. She it said she went to college in Chicago, Alan, mm-hmm. and she, um, uh, I don't know, who, you know, Becky didn't go to college where I was. So anyway, uh, she's fascinated with the Marina Towers. And um, I, I think, honestly, I think a lot of people, if you've watched any kind of mainstream medias, particularly Batman or these, the, the Marina Towers have been in movies if you've oh, been, been to Chicago, you've movies, seen them right. because they stand out against the Chicago skyline. They're a little bit of a different construction. But, um, Alan, I, I've driven by. I've actually been in the Marina Towers. Mm-hmm. But um, the uh, we're going to do a deep dive because, honestly, it has implications that even reach here to Memphis. And um, it, it it's a pretty big and all-encompassing uh, conversation. So, folks, if you don't know... The Marina Towers, just pull up a image of the Chicago skyline, and you're going to see a lot of 
very square, you know, a lot of uh, glass and metal constructions mm -hmm. where basically it's sort of rectangular, square, whatever, and it, it's vertical. Well, the, and then in the middle of it, you're going to see these two things that almost look like two corn cobs. I think that's what people have called them. They're round. They're sort of... <laughs> that was reminded me more of stacks of coins. Yeah, they it, and they're round, and they were very different for back in the day. So here's a couple of bullet points, Alan. So it was built in 1967. Mm -hmm. um, they're twin. They're basically twin apartment towers, but at the bottom of them, it's um, it's like its own city and everything. They were designed by Bertrand Goldberg, mm -hmm. and um, basically back in the day, I, I dare say, Alan, people who were maybe 30 years old. Uh, or so, they probably can't understand how different cities were maybe 60 or 70 years ago in terms of, you know, we, we, we go to a city today, we go here in Memphis, I've seen, you know, downtown St. Louis, you have, it It doesn't just, uh, it. people live there, people work there, They're, it's very um, dynamic, but in the old days, cities used to basically be a place, uh, you went to work and then you went home, you know. During the suburb, I don't know, I'm, I'm, I'm sort of generalizing, but um, basically back in the day when suburbs became a big thing um, and people were moving out of the city, suddenly they noticed this this um, situation where there was nothing happening after, after business hours. And so the uh, Marina Towers were an effort to make city life attractive again. And that's kind of our jumping off point. So that, That's a good spot. That's okay. a good spot. But you wanted to bring in something about... Uh, about what was happening. We're talking the well, 50s and 60s because there was a huge dynamic change in the country that brought us this situation, right? Well, so. yeah, of nothing happens in a void. Right. So, you know, when this was completed in 1967, but keep in mind, this was being built, designed and built throughout the bulk of the 60s. Right. So, right. I mean, it's not like somebody went, all right, Here's twenty million dollars in 1966, and in 1967 you had a building, right? Uh, you know, so this this idea got played around with, but the world itself was changing rather drastically. Of uh, Chicago was a great example because Chicago, forever uh, in this country, was that centerpiece. It's where the railways went. It's where kind of a hub. Yeah. Well, you had the New York, Chicago, kind of the L.A. thing going on. Right. Um, you know, we can't forget the mob. Yeah, you, you, no can't, you can't forget the mob. Yeah. Uh, there was a lot going on all of this era. And but then we get to the we, we get to the end of World War Two and the end of World War Two. Everybody came back home from Europe, from the European theater and of our one of our, our dear presidents, uh, Eisenhower, had served, you know, this distinguishedly over there. Right. And one of the things that made him crazy was the fact that you couldn't drive anywhere. Um, oh, and, okay. And, so you and had to just take there were trains? All or these, just... Well, there was all these little roads and hedgeways and little roundabouts, but there was no real way of getting straight from point A to point B. Oh, I see where you're going. Yeah. So yeah. suddenly he comes back and looks at the, you know, he's driving around Boston. He's driving around the eastern U.S., and we look just like the theater he just left. Right. And he goes, no, 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 no. We, we, need, we need to be able to get from point A to point B. So thus began the Eisenhower Project, or better, we better know it as the interstates. Yeah. Hey, sorry, quick. Alan, you Dive know, in. when you trigger thought, you make me think. Mm -hmm. Okay, well, you made an observation uh, a few weeks ago. It wasn't on the air, but you and I were talking about Europe. And the notion, okay, you can go... If you were driving six hours through Europe, you might hit four different countries yes. because they're boom, 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 boom. Well, each country may feel like, well, we've got our roads. We can get to where we're going. So there wasn't this notion. But, you know, if you drive across America, which I have, mm. it's pretty big. <laughs> <laughs> and I can't imagine taking a little two-lane road from here to, like, California Well, or you think you're so. like Route 66. Right, Which right. is renowned because mm. it went from yeah. Chicago I mean, it would West. take you a week to get there. And, and it was it was an experience. Right. Right. Uh, we even had crazy stuff like the sand road across one of the deserts. We had, you know. Oh, so sure. Welcome to all this craziness. Now, here's the other thing that kind of started happening. Cinema. Oh, yeah. We began getting, now let's think about the golden era of bad B movies. Yeah, that's, that's because your wheelhouse, that, Alan. That's yeah. going into the 50s and 60s, but, <laughs> right. you know, we had the nuclear war threats, and we had giant ants and 50-foot-tall women, and 
Yeah. But science fiction was a huge influence, and we had some books back then that we still read today as classics. Right. Stranger in a Strange Land, 1984. And all of these, now, kind of let's take all of that, shove it in a big box, let's shake it up, and now let's add our artists, our architects, our engineers. Right. This, this new idea that we can build anything. Mm-hmm. And, and keep in mind, in 1968, the thought in our mind is we have never been smarter and we have never had better equipment. I mean, they're in the middle of making plans to go to the moon. We've we're, got all sorts oh, of, we've, we're you know, televisions in, in everybody's we got house TV, now. We got, yeah. we got, so welcome to just the, the age of, you we're know, gonna we pretty this. much doing exactly that. Yeah. It's kind of, I was kind of the, the Joe factor. It's the, we can do this. Right, right. Very positive. So here comes Bertram Goldberg, and he says, in our cities, we need cities within cities. Oh, Al, you, you skipped over something, though. The Eisenhower, basically what you're saying, he created the expressway. Right. Well, what that also allowed is the is the suburbs to suddenly boom. Oh, yeah. You don't have to drive two hours to get to work. You could work, you could live in the suburbs, which... That's kind of, you know, the town I grew up in was, was about 20, An hour 20, and a half 20 miles outside country of, road. Right, right, but it, by country road. So suddenly you have this quick way to get to work. So minutes. why not live in a nice big house instead of a city, which people were fleeing the cities at this point. They were. They so were. There so, you go. So here comes Bertrand, and he is like, okay, here's our problem with our cities. Of They were laid out a certain way, mm -hmm. and that doesn't really work. Right. anymore it's this we're at the 60s we're, we we need to do this and he really had this idea about preserving the use of land right so instead of spreading out mr goldberg went we should and this is an actual quote we shall turn our streets up into the air right and stack the daytime and nighttime use of our land right right so he also was a huge uh, naturalist movement kind of believer. He and, was a little ahead of the curve on some of this. And, yeah. yeah, he was. And I'm funny that you used the word curve. Yeah, because there you go. Uh, yeah. he he didn't believe in straight lines. He said a, a, a 90 degree angle doesn't exist in nature. It's not going to exist in what I build. Right now, in fairness, they do have doors and stuff. Oh, but yeah. what you're talking about is the main construction. So, folks, if you look at it, it's two. It's two towers, and um, what's what's distinctive about it, too, is each balcony, there's a, so, okay, so the elevators go up the center of each of these towers. Mm -hmm. What that means is you, you, you exit and you come into this round hallway, so every apartment or condo, whatever they are, um, exits, on, they all have their own balcony. Yes. And it's a pie shape. It's a weird, Alan, like I said, I've been in there, so you walk in, it's narrow, but then it widens out yes. into like a, a slice, but that also, he really wanted to accentuate um, connecting with the outdoors, and so your balcony is sort of the centerpiece of this place, because these balconies are like a half moon shape, and they're huge. I mean, they're you could almost call them outdoor living space. They're, they're they really were. nice. So, they, yeah. they were designed to give you the suburban experience in an urban setting. Right. So right. that was the kind of cool thing. Now, the other thing that happened here was counter levering. Now, when we, 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 when we look at your second story house and you got a balcony mm -hmm. or you got something out there and it may be counter levered to the building. I don't know. Tell us what you mean by so that. So where it's balanced. AKA a lot of the building techniques that went into Marina City because Marina City is on the water. Right. Yeah, that's the official name. We uh, around the city we always call it Marina Towers, but right. it's actually Marina City it because is actually Marina at the city. bottom of this thing is like its own city. It, so. It's a full marina, and it, when it originally opened, it had a theater, a gym, a swimming pool. I think it even had an ice rink. I it has an ice up. rink. It's got a it's bowling right alley. Yeah, it's right um, above the uh, Allen. It's right above um, the train station, so you can yeah, conceivably yeah. not even t touch. Uh, you, you don't even have to really go right. outside. You can get to the train. It's right on the Chicago River. You could have a boat. You could walk mm -hmm. along the walkway there, and it's got a theater. It's got grocery stores. It's got, yeah, restaurants. It's its its own community. And, and it also touched on, uh, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to shoot my eyes sideways at Max over here and go, it also touched a little bit on modern brutalism and the oh, fact yeah. that they didn't waste a lot of of flurry 
to mm-hmm. the exterior of the building. Because the exterior of the building is pretty contained. Now, yeah. what I like about the idea of this as a, um, a, as a form of brutalism is it shows that brutalism doesn't necessarily extend to, like, the geometric. Because when I associate brutalism, I just see, like, these square, cold, dead structures. But I like this idea of, like, a flourishing brutalism where it's like, oh, we have a little bit of a respect for nature. But at the same time, it's still very utterly simplistic in its design yeah because it's pretty much concrete and a little bit of steel that's both basically what you right. see on this but it's very round and you know it's well of- a lot of the techniques that were used to create this we're still using today oh these yeah. wonderful ideas of even here in town i'm gonna pick on the concourse right the, the sears concourse which is a much older building Mm-hmm. Much, much older, and it was originally a million square foot warehouse, and was an absolute perfect example of brutalism. Hey, Alan, I just want to say for anybody that's listening outside of Memphis, I would just jump on Google, mm-hmm. Google the Sears uh, Crosstown uh, Concourse building, and it's super interesting. But yeah, and, well, it's kind of the uh, would you say it's the grandchild of this idea? I think this it's very safe to say this. Yeah, Gold, um, Goldberg. He might have inspired this, for all we know, this mm. because it's, yeah, exactly. So Well, so here we have, and now keep in mind, this guy's working next to water. Right. And he wants to build these, these big buildings, and kind of as a tie-in to what I'm going to talk about later, there's a lot of circular action going on here. He is, he is really using of the pillar strength, pre-stressed concrete, counter-levering, and a lot of white space to reduce the weight of the concrete to keep these buildings good and secure. Yeah. And all these years later, even being built right there next to water, these buildings uh, were pushing 40 plus years. Almost, um, well, almost 50 67, years that's 50. Yeah, that's, that's over. That's 50 plus. That's 55 years. Uh, so. And they yeah. are still standing strong of... Uh, I understand, as I was doing a little research on it this morning, of there's like a big thing about renovating your units and renting them out and people live there. Well, here's what uh, I wanted to It's still an active community. Yeah, here's what I wanted to say about that, Alan, because one of the things that I did appreciate in my research was, okay, one of the things, let's just be honest, we had, we had a lot of tension in the 60s, and this is oh, yeah. built in the middle of all of that. So people are fleeing the cities. Um, there, there was racial tension. There were things like that. There was division in our country, and this was built to be. This was built to accommodate um, basically a, a very diverse array of tenants. They wanted right. everybody to live there, and also, um, so basically, if you can imagine, folks, there, the, each each one is almost pie shaped. Yes. So maybe you're a college student and you can't afford a big. So you you move into a single pie wedge Mm -hmm. (laughs) maybe you're a family you move into three wedge you know the way they had them laid out this is a two and three bedroom one if maybe you're a um you know maybe you're a a young couple or something so you had a lot of variety in what you could buy you didn't have to just get the uh single slice so to speak alan right and what that what what that created was it it sort of became this beacon of look look at all the this diverse group of people living together they you know which is very cool. The way the the balconies are set up and the way the architecture is uh, designed, it encourages you to interact with your neighbors. It doesn't mean you're on top of each other, but it also doesn't mean you're closed in in your own little cubicle. It's it's a really interesting mm-hmm. uh, model. And then you go down the elevators, and boom, you're there's oh, over there is the theater. Over there is the grocery store. Over here is the restaurant and and the skating rink. And people. You, you could honestly hang out there and not leave for a week. You could just Easily. live in the marina tower. So. I also like this one video that I watched where it's like these people are on the rooftop of the building and like the cylinder in the center, they project like a movie from there and it's sort of a community activity. Yeah. It, it, yeah, it's pretty cool, Max. I mean, it's and I, like I said, I've been there. Um, a lot of the, it, it's been renovated. If you ever look at some of the videos, Alan, you see the cheesy 1950s, uh, oh, what well, they consider yeah. modern. But but man, there's some really nice, you know. There, there was there was some serious Flintstones influence there. Sometimes you look at this and went, oh, 
We're the '60s projecting what the '90s are going to look like. Right, right. We didn't, we didn't get close. But we, fo- we did a bad job. Yeah, so. but folks, we, uh, we, I posted a video on our face on the uh, Tool Talk Radio Facebook page about the Marina Towers. I think it's about five mm-hmm. minutes. Pretty good, pretty comprehensive. But you may want to, uh, you know, go down that rabbit hole. It's very interesting, and like we say, it's probably the grandfather of the Crosstown, you know, building well, here in Memphis. The, so. Well, actually, anything with that uh, reinforced modular concrete, this was a shining example of how that technology would hold up. Yeah, absolutely. So, Becky, thanks for getting in touch, and we encourage you, you know, get mm-hmm. in touch. You can uh, call or text us anytime at the Big M Roofing and Remodeling Hotline at 901-683-0989. Correction, Alan. They send can call us, us during the show. Send us uh, a text. But during the week, uh, send us a text and, and send us a request. You'll go to the front of the line. Oh, absolutely. Our listeners come first here at mm-hmm. Tool Talk Radio, Alan. Well, you're listening to Tool Talk Radio here at News Talk 98.9, The Roar of Memphis. We're going to take a quick break then. Alan, I have a heartwarming story about a pallet. All right. Tool Talk Radio with Joe and Alan. Oh, I get it, Mr. Krabs. You told us the paint was permanent so me and Patrick would be more careful and not get paint on anything. Nah, I just like to mess with you. <laughs> News Talk 98.9, the roar of Memphis. I think Max is the Mr. Krabs of this show. <laughs> I was about to say. Jeez. And Thank we'll, you. Yeah, yeah. He wears that He wears that with honor. Yep, yeah, yep, yeah, yeah, proudly. And welcome back to uh, Tool Talk Radio, coming to you from the Brown Refrigeration Studios. I'm Joe Thorderson with Thor's Hammer, Carpentry and Wood Turning, here with my buddy Alan Gilbert from Dark Oak Media, and our pal Max over there behind the glass where he belongs. You can call or text us at the hey, Big Hey, I can still taunt. <laughs> exactly. You can call or text us at the Big M Roofing and Remodeling Hotline at 901-683-0989. And we invite you to go to uh, Tool T- the Tool Talk Radio Facebook page, which is basically Tool Talk Radio. Yep. And, um, you know, check out all the action over there, including the video we posted about our conversation today about Marina City. One of our listeners, Becky, called in and left a voice message and, re- and uh, requested that we do some research. Ooh, yeah. Becky, I hope we uh, lived up to your expectations. I don't know. But, um, Alan, um, before we move on from the topic, we had a few parting thoughts about Marina City. Because, honestly, like we said, it it is sort of, it, if it wasn't the blueprint, it's definitely sort of a beacon of mm. what city life has really kind of grown into. It used to, I can remember a day, Alan, when I was little, you would go to the business district in Chicago, and if you were there on a Saturday or after 6 o'clock, it was like a ghost town. There was nothing. Right. Everybody left. The, Goldberg's idea, what he he basically coined this phrase, living above the store. Right. You work, you go to work, you do your thing, then you go upstairs to your apartment. It, it's sort of more intermixed, so you don't leave the city. Well, that is actually an, kind of an ancient way of living, as, right. as a lot of shop owners and stuff did live behind or above their stores. Right. And the other flip side to this is pre-stressed building, pre-designed, prefabricated, because as this thing was going up, it it looked like they were building little stacks of flat flapjacks. Yeah. Because they had a center core Mm -hmm. that was, you know, the the, the idea was we're going to really anchor this baby to the center of this, but then we can counter lever these prefabricated basically circles of concrete. Right. So there was a whole lot of speculation as to how well this thing was going to stand up or more likely fall down. Right, yeah. Because uh, you think like something like the Hoover Dam, which was poured in place, that was kind of the thought behind concrete. Oh, yeah. This We're going to make it somewhere else and bring it in. Was You know, it wasn't brand new idea, but right. it was... Nobody had seen it look like this. Yeah. So, you know, hats off to Mr. Goldberg for um, really having some ideas, but also consider the expertise of, and I'm going to say the artisans that built this. Sure. Because all of this had to be carefully loaded, installed, and then, I mean, you think about the amount of double checking that went into making sure this building was safe. And now we're talking about it 50 years later yeah. as being, you know, it's mid-modernism. It's a little of this. It's a little of that. But it's been renovated. And now the building gets to come to its own because we have the Internet now. Right. 
which was a speculation in the 60s of are we, you know, we can actually order things and have things delivered. We can have the convenience of living anywhere and have it brought right to you where you live. Oh, so in other words, you could work in the city, live in the city. And Stay in the city, but yet delivered. enjoy yeah. all of the other aspects. And die in the city. Yeah. Well, no, I don't know. That I happens. Mean, <laughs> there's people that live at, at one point in my life, Max, I actually thought I might like to live in the city. It, it doesn't appeal to me the same way it did now, but a lot of people, that's, that's what they're, you know, Seinfeld. Mm -hmm. it, imagine Seinfeld in the suburbs. That wouldn't have been a funny show, Alan. Um, <laughs> There'd have been a lot of grass cutting. Yeah. It's just not the it, same thing. It just thing. wouldn't have worked. So right. anyway, but ha uh, thanks again, Becky. And we encourage you, you know, if you, it doesn't have to be, uh, it could be really anything that we find interesting. And if, yes. uh, it, leave us a message and we will, uh, we may do a deep dive. But uh, but like I said, our listener requests always come, come first. So Alan, you know who else uh, comes first? Uh, the customers of Big M Roofing oh, and yes, Remodeling. Was that finally a smooth transition? It was. I it undercut was it by mentioning it. One yeah, day, that's my quest. On your own, yeah. yeah, my quest <laughs> is to have a smooth transition. But that wasn't, you know, that wasn't a bad that wasn't one. That wasn't bad. Okay, Alan, uh, the rain is back, mm. I've noticed. And it's it's not just um, it's not just this uh, nice little gentle shower. For some reason, we went from drought and heat conditions to just pounding rain i mean it's been i've been seeing oh flooded gosh. streets yes. i've been seeing i was i i had to divert where i was going home the other day because the, the there was two streets that mm. were flooded uh you know i'm sure our roofs are not happy but uh I, our, our your roof and my roof were just fine because we got true. brand new roofs but if you've got any roofing issues and today and actually this situation is a perfect time to walk around yes maybe you've got some rooms upstairs that you hardly ever go into this is a time to check all the ceilings yes. and and maybe even get up in your attic and see what's going on in there. You it, maybe you've got a new leak that you didn't have last year or something. But if you've got any roofing issues, uh, we highly recommend getting in touch with our good buddy Jay Hill with Big M Roofing and Remodeling. For one thing, he is a GAF Master Elite installer, five stars with the Better Business Bureau and good housekeeping. The craftsmanship is is outstanding. They install mm. roofing systems. Uh, also, the remodeling work. He's got a yes. great staff for that. He likes those unusual projects. That's sort of, Jay and I see eye to mm. eye on that, at least. He, he, he and likes I like those the, home offices. Yeah, he likes those yeah. out of the box type of uh, remodeling projects as well. But the good, the uh, the what what sets Jay apart, aside from his dynamic personality, <laughs> mm. which is its own, we could do a podcast on that by itself. We have <laughs> is uh, the fact that Jay is a former insurance agent. And what that means to you is there are times where your roofing repairs uh, or roofing replacement may be covered by your homeowner's insurance because that's why we have yes. homeowner's insurance. Alan, you and I benefited from yes, Jay's expertise big time. And uh, Jay is a former insurance agent, so uh, he also keeps up with the latest protocols and he also basically knows everybody in town that's involved with insurance. <laughs> and so you cannot, uh, I mean, that's the kind of expertise you want. So if you have an issue with your roof, get in touch with Jay. The consultation is free and yes. it's a very, uh, it's a very exciting uh, thing when you feel like, um, man, I have this problem that's going to, it's going to cost me all sorts of money. It's going to be insurmountable. And Jay comes in with a, with a solution for you. Yeah, that was the most does. exciting part yeah. for me, you know, when, when he, he found us a way out of this. And now today, Alan, every time it rains like this, I go look out my back window. I stand there with my hands on my hips and I laugh <laughs> up at the sky and go, ha, 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 bring your worst. So yeah, be careful about that. Yeah, so. <laughs> I probably shouldn't do that. But anyway, if you want to have that kind of a, uh, that kind of experience, get in touch with our good buddy, Jay Hill. You can call him directly at 901-484-484. 5645 or go to com. Well, Alan, uh, this is in, this is sort of interesting. You know, I as you know, Alan, I live in a um I have a huge well, I have a big backyard and I live in a busy intersection. Yes, you do. I, I like where I live though because our house is set back just enough where it's um it's not really affected by the noise of the traffic mm -hmm. or anything like that. But what what that translates to a lot because I do a lot of work in my garage. I'm either doing my wood turnings or I'm doing something. I kind of right. have a shop set up there. Well, I've been doing some projects that involve basically having things delivered to my house over the last few months, which what that means is I keep winding up with these pallets. Mm. And, uh, okay. you know, you, I know you're a pallet man. You're a pallet I enthusiast. Am a, I'm a, I, that is a good word for it. I'm a pallet enthusiast. Well, I one am. of the, one of the benefits about where I live is, um, 
if I need to get rid of something, like maybe I have an old bike in the garage right. that we just aren't, I put it at the curb and literally 30 minutes later, it's gone. Somebody, Somebody comes by and goes, hey, what are you doing with this? Right, right. because I live in a busy, I, I've gotten rid of chairs, old couches, <laughs> just stuff like that. Because, hey, yeah, why throw it out? Let people hey, use it if they want to take I'm it. I'm completely with you. So when I have these pallets, Alan, I just stick them at the curb and, mm -hmm. you know, they're gone. You know, well, it's right. interesting because I've been home a few times when this happens and there's sort of this pattern emerging. Okay. I'm seeing young, I would call, they're probably college students. A lot of female right. college students are picking these pallets up. Okay. Well, I'm out in my garage, which I thought, okay, I'm going to just make a mental note of that. What are, what are they doing with these pallets? Well, I'm out in my driveway, Alan, working yesterday. I have a pallet at the curb. Mm -hmm. And this young lady, I'm going to give her a shout out. Her name was Layla. Okay. She came up and she said, and she very polite, nice kid mm -hmm. and everything. Mm -hmm. And she said, uh, excuse me, um, are you getting rid of that pallet? And I said, yeah, you know, and she she got very excited. She yeah. she's, And I said, I'll help you load it up and everything. Okay. And I said, look, I got to ask you something. I'm, I'm just really curious. What are you going to do with this thing? She goes, oh, my gosh, I've been watching videos. I, I'm nope. either, she, I'm, I might make a, a table out of it. I, there's a picnic bench sort of thing you can do. She was just really gung-ho about this pallet. Yes. And um, I, I think that's pretty awesome, man. A lot of times today with our young people, I think there's this sort of dismissive People our age, it's easy for us to go, you know, kids today, they don't do it. Mm -hmm. They sit on the couch mm -hmm. and play video mm -hmm. games and they're on their phone all the time. But I see a lot of cool activities going on with, with young people, you know. I, I will say the last three years has created a, a shift in the dynamic. Yeah. And I'm seeing of, I'm seeing a lot more creativity with quote unquote the milk crate. Oh yeah, yeah. yeah I'm, I'm having. Was the milk crate the palate of the uh, 70s? Well, yeah, yeah, the milk. Yeah, <laughs> the milk. The crate milk crate was, used to be a thing. Same it was the building blocks. block of right. I cannot tell you how many first apartments. Oh yeah, of yeah. the palate of the the. All right, here's the cool thing about the palate. You know, when I remember palates when I first started working, and of course that's 800 years ago, they were they were really kind of ra really ugly dirty raggedy looking things some of them still are Alan. now I well but depending on how much on abuse they've seen well it yeah. depends on what's being delivered right because yeah that I manure pallet you, isn't too much ooh, fun to, yeah. yeah that <laughs> i'm gonna leave that there yeah of uh, however like the projects you're doing of uh, you get a lot of nice new equipment that's been palletized and shipped over yeah they're not something. gonna stick that on something and yeah. There, I got news for you. There's some pretty good looking pallets out there these days. Oh, now yeah. I work with a lot of medical facilities, so we get really good looking pallets, right? Shiny, new, first time it's ever been used type things. And I cannot tell you how many pallet tables mm -hmm. I have made over the last 10 years. Well, it's it's interesting because. You look at it, and it's uh, the way, and I guess, I, I don't know if we should explain, a pallet, folks, is something, you know, sometimes you go to Home Depot mm. or you go someplace where there's a lot of just, you know, they might have bags of uh, concrete, and they basically stick them on pallets, which is just a bunch of wooden slats that are strong enough where the forklift can yeah, get under it. Yeah, it's a couple it of two-by-fours and some wooden slats to make sure you basically have a base to put and, stuff on. And I happen to know that they are 42 inches across by 48 inches yes, across they and they're about 6 inches thick and everything yep. like that. But um but that what that what that brings you it reminds me a little of the I beam, Alan. It brings you something pre-made that is mm -hmm. pretty strong. It's it's strong enough that they can lift 800 pounds of uh you know, concrete or something. Yes. So it the construction of a pallet, it's light enough she this this young lady was able to pick it up and, mm -hmm. and move it. So it's it's a pretty versatile thing, and it's the kind of thing people don't care about. Like you right. can go get free pallets. It, it occurred to me, Alan. You remember a couple of weeks ago, I went and visited my daughter in Knoxville, and she's in an interesting place. She lives in um, this. It's a it, there's a part of Knoxville where it's uh, it's kind of like I would call it the the same the midtown of Memphis. It's got right. that same vibe. A lot of older homes. She lives in a home that's about a hundred years old. And the owner, it's a two-story place. They divide it into five, basically, apartments. Okay, that's well, cool. Well, everything in there is something she either made herself or refinished or found at the curb. 
or whatever. Repurposed the, or right. Yeah, I was pretty proud because you know she's she's a year out of college, so you know she's rolling in money, Alan. Oh yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> so yeah, <laughs> but but mm. the creativity and the and the varied use for things, I think it's great. And I mean, I just want to say, don't be so judgmental out there about young people. It's always easy to just dismiss the generation of the day, but honestly, they they're out there carrying on the tradition. They're still building things. They're yeah. still making things. Well, you know, I'm getting more and more. E e well, I'm going to go back to one of my favorite Saturday afternoon occupations, which has always cracked you up. Yeah. Is, you know, basically giving people a tour of the big box store. Yeah. You know, yeah. somebody calls me up and goes, all right, look, I, I, my parents are leaving me this house or I just bought this and I walked in this place and I am utterly intimidated. And I'm like, eh, let's go shopping. Let right. me Let me give you the tour. And ease you into my world. When are these big box stores going to pay you for this service, Alan? Well, I mean, you're basically you know, my, a tour my, guide my, bringing in new customers. My, so. my clients pay me pretty good. I get fed a lot. You know, we get, yeah, you know. it sounds like free pizza there, but okay. But yeah. you know, when you walk through, and what I'm saying is people are discovering, it's kind of like eating the elephant. One little bite at a time. So we got a pallet. What can you do with a pallet? Well, you can stick legs on it. You have pretty mm -hmm. much an instant junk table. Um, and if there's a section there where you can buy the pre-made legs and yeah. screw them um, into place. And, yeah. uh, you know, if you're a crafter, if you're trying to make stuff and do things at home, now you got a junk table. Right. And when you totally, totally mess this thing up, you throw it out. You got a fire pit, chop yeah. it up and throw yeah. it in. Oh, yeah. well, everybody's got a fire pit these days. So, <laughs> uh, And the other thing that's surprising a lot of people is the quality of wood that occasionally gets put in these things. I'm I'm sort of impressed. Now, this pallet was made out of oak. Yes. What's up with that? I, I mean, <clears throat> that's pretty, you know, really, I should have kept it and just well, ran it through the planer and made some. I mean, oh, this days, that was probably $500 worth of lumber, the way right, the well, prices well, are. <laughs> well, here in town, you know? Joe, Joe and I have an associate uh, named Angel, yeah. who's uh, a professional pirate and actress and that kind of stuff. Yeah. And uh, she was uh, regaling me a week ago that she had bought a new orbital sander. Oh, because yeah. she had picked up a couple of pallets and was sanding down the rough edges and stuff and was using them in her garden. Oh, yeah. So yeah. They, she's made a junk table and she's got little walkways and she's got a little thing set up for the dog. And so having a little fun with repurposing. Yeah, I uh, think that's what a it pallet is. is easy because it's an exact it's a size and a shape. Right. But with a little imagination, you can really kind of run with this. Oh, yeah. I saw a staircase made out of pallets. I don't know that no, I go that awesome. direction, but, uh, yeah, it's, you know. Uh, um, I have, I, I've seen the around-the-tree seating. I have not had a chance to do that yet, mm -hmm. but that may have to be a fall project for me. Yeah, especially, you know, pallets are basically free. So so hats off to, uh, to Layla, uh, my daughter, Michaela, a lot of just the young people out there yeah. carrying on the tradition. And um, you they're know, getting into being it. creative. So, hey, on speaking of young people, I want to shift gears a little bit. It's uh, I, 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 you might have noticed traffic wise schools back. Mm -hmm. I know in other parts of the country, kids go back to school in September. But here in the Mid-South, they're, they're back. And um, college is going to be starting up, I think, either next week or the right. week after. Mm -hmm. Well, Alan, you and I are this is sort of become a, a yearly tradition for us. But with. Uh, when you send your student back to school, um, maybe oh, they're going, yes. or especially their first their first outing. Um, I remember this specifically when my daughter moved away uh, to Knoxville and she w moved into her dorm. Mm -hmm. Well, you would think, okay, well, dorms have everything they need right there. They're small. No, what do no. you know? Well, I, the first thing I did, uh, well, the, one of the first things I did is I got her a toolkit. Right. And we are big advocates of sending yours. It doesn't mean you send them off with a, you know. A whole pallet full of tools, Alan. No, but but there's but, there's a there's a handy. I would say get yourself a toolbox and and outfit it with the tools they're going to need. And so let's talk about some of the tools you might want to send your students off with. So I've got a list, and yeah, you're going to laugh right. because well, I'm I'm, I'm going to start with a decent tool bag. Right. Doesn't even need to be a toolbox. I am a huge advocate of the uh, lighter weight. Oh, you want the canvas type the, the, thing. the tool bag itself because, eh, you know, you can throw it in the back of the car and off you go and you don't have to worry about anything. It's not going to scratch anything up. It's uh, not going to Because I have be seen abrasive. tool bags that uh, basically it's a toolbox, but it's made of a right. durable canvas really and, and you canvas. can yeah. fold it up if it comes to that. So, yeah, yeah. that's probably a good one. Yeah, yeah, I like that because it doesn't, well, it doesn't, you know, it, it's being bounced around in the car. Because mm -hmm. keep in mind, if they move into the dorm, they got to move out of the dorm. 
Right. And this doesn't rub against something and scratch stuff. I, I know it's a little thing, but you can tell it's happened to me in the past where I put something metal next to something I shouldn't have. And by the time I got there, it had etched a nice, you know, oh, yeah. ridge into it. Okay. Uh, Alan, what uh, you got? Well, my thing is going to be one that's going to make you laugh, but you're going to send. If, if, I, if I could uh, put one thing at the top of the list, I would get a very small battery powered drill. Because oh, a drill, um, you know, obviously you can put screwdriver attachments. Yes. You can drill holes. You can do, they may go get themselves a little pallet. It makes something, mm -hmm. the ability to drill and the fact that the, um, Alan has brought me over to the dark side. <laughs> I am be, I've become a big advocate of the battery powered. A plug in one is a hassle because then they're going to need an extension cord and everything. Just get them. How about one of those hand crank ones like from the Blues Brothers? Yeah, we could. Well, we could do that. We could send them back. Oh, I in like time. those. Yeah, I do but, actually do like those. I have one of those. But Alan, that's that's at the top of my list. But there's one thing that you did not mention that I was waiting for you to mention. But uh I'm surprised. Oh, uh, you said you had a list. I was waiting on the list to see if you left it off. Well, but. I didn't want to steal your thunder, but since you didn't mention it, um, give them a packet of command strips. Oh, my gosh. You're yes. a command. Tell people what a command strip right. is because uh, that's sort of your Yeah, the your 3M baby. manufacturing company makes this little thing with, with wall hooks. Right. And they come in different weights, and they actually have a little piece of adhesive tape mm -hmm. that when you stretch it, it breaks the adhesive. Right. So for of any time you do, a lot of churches now don't let you pin things up or hey, command oh, yeah. hooks. Command yeah. hooks are your friends. Um, if you haven't seen a good command hook selection, swing by any big box store, any department store, anybody like that. And, and command hooks send us the money. Oh, yeah. I wish they would. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> I'm a huge, they owe me some commission yeah. of. The biggest thing is you can adhese this to the wall, and now you have a place instantly to hang a shirt, or you can hang a picture of off art. of it, or yeah. you can whatever. And when you're done, you take it down, you pull the little tab, the thing pops off the wall. No harm, no foul, no hole. They're a brilliant uh, invention, and they're uh, remarkably strong. You can, I mean, I'm not going to say you can hang your barbells up there or something, but. Uh no, yeah. but they come in different sizes, weights, and descriptions. There's right. probably a hundred different kinds of them these days. But, oh, my gosh, they are so convenient for I need this here for X amount of time. Absolutely. So Perfect another thing. Another thing on my list, Alan, is, okay, when you go to the hammer aisle, mm. we're not talking about, you know, don't send them off with a sledgehammer. No. Don't send, uh, uh, you know, but there is a beautiful, uh, happy medium where I would give them – Probably an undersized hammer. Not a, it's still strong enough to drive a nail in or something. Hammer or something like that. They're know. gonna need to, to 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 hammer things in. A nice variety of well, okay, four screwdrivers. Let's do this. Mm. A stubby flathead <laughs> and a stubby Phillips head, and then a normal size flathead and a normal Phillips head because th those are sort of essential. Oh. Uh, go ahead, Max. I would also recommend. Um, uh, hex bits because like not only are you might have to deal with like come um, a home improvement like with your new dorm but uh, hex bits are very important too with cars well if you have to do car work too there you go okay mm -hmm. since uh, we're running out of time max you you stole that's very good Al an allen set a set of allen wrenches oh, those are small absolutely if they yeah. go to ikea or something they have to assemble something yes. also a small socket set yes that's a must now you they can actually may get all of that in one kit yeah there are a number of excellent kits that right. you can go look at. Of uh, Christmas is not that far away. Uh huh. And not a bad idea to keep an eye open. This is going to sound crazy, but a pack of uh, two hundred, uh, 150 grit sandpaper. Trust me, mm. I don't know why, but they're going to need that. They may have to sand the pallet down, Alan. Yeah, they, but uh, if you uh, send them on, in other words, send your college students off prepared, and that includes being able to fix things and to, yeah. and to build things as they as they need because uh, that's important. So it's easy to overlook that when you're sending them off to school, but we highly recommend that. So, um, And if you've got any recommendations, get in touch oh, yeah. with us at the Big M Roofing and Remodeling Hotline, 901-683-0989, and, and weigh in. This we is hope Hope the topic. dorms also have plungers too. Mm. Oh, good point, Max. Bring a plunger. He always he always keeps things focused. Well, <laughs> hour one of Tool Talk Radio is in the can, <laughs> but hour two is coming up, and it's going to kick off with a great moments in building history uh, that Alan is going to spearhead. We are. News Talk 98.9, the roar of Memphis. Tool Talk Radio with Joe and Alan. 
And welcome to Hour 2 of Tool Talk Radio, coming to you from the Brown Refrigeration Studios. I'm Joe Thorderson with Thor's Hammer, Carpentry and Wood Turning, here with my buddy Alan Gilbreth from DarkOakMedia.com and our pal Max behind the glass. You can call or text us at the Big M Roofing and Remodeling Hotline at 901-683-0989. And you can always check out the action over at the Tool Talk Radio Facebook page, Tool Talk Ra- at Tool Talk Radio. That's a, is it called a handle? I guess, I don't know. Yes. I feel like I got to clarify, Alan. You yes, know, so. it's at Tool Talk Radio. And at that Tool is Talk our Radio. Facebook handle. And you can go to tooltalkradio.com. You can go to Spotify. You can yes, go to you YouTube. Can. You can listen. You know, you can check out. If you just woke up and you missed our uh, conversation from earlier, never fear. When Alan posts it, you'll be able to hear our discussion. Mm-hmm. So among them, Alan, we uh, we responded to a listener comment. Becky wanted to learn more about the uh, Marina Towers in Chicago, which actually led to a bigger discussion about, sit, you know, city Indeed. planning and things like that. And, and uh as we said, uh, the listener requests come first from now on, you know, here at uh, Tool Talk Radio. So if you have something interesting you want to say or have us weigh in on, um, you can leave a text any day of the week at 901 683 And um, that's probably the best way to do it. Send us a text or, you yep. know, uh, it, it whatever. But, um, Alan, uh, before we get out of this subject, I, I just wanted to say, you know, we were talking about sending um, students back to school uh, you know, giving them giving them a toolkit and uh, and don't you know just keeping them prepared. A dorm is still a home or a little a little apartment. They're going to have needs and don't send them off without without a good tool set. So uh, well, nothing is more frustrating right than having a very tiny small job to do mm-hmm. and not having the tool to do it right. And that is and and I'm going to throw in that is when accidents with really bad stories start coming <laughs> into play. So why were you trying to hammer something with a stapler? Right. And now you were we getting, now we're at the emergency room getting a staple out of your ear or a rock. Uh, or oh something. my gosh, yes. Of just the tiny little and it hasn't got to be a great kit, it hasn't got to be all the that and a bag of chips. But if you've got a youngster on the road, I'm going to throw in a new power, uh, new powered tool for you, Joe. Okay. Of uh, another another dear friend of ours just purchased one, and that is the rechargeable battery system tire inflator. Oh, tell us what that is. Those things oh. are great. Yeah. You know, well, for years we've had the ability to plug it into your cigarette lighter and you got the little pump and you can you can re-air your tires. Yeah, I got news for you, Alan. Those things take like an hour to work. They do. <laughs> They're real right. slow. However, yeah. uh, a couple of companies have, with their battery systems yeah. have come out with tire inflators. And you know what? Mm-hmm. They don't take an hour. No, I you, think I think you're right. I don't want my uh, or or I think in that pack, Alan, um, uh, I think it has the ability to jumpstart the car. Yes. You don't want your kid in the middle of nowhere. All of a sudden their car battery dies and they, you know, I, I have carried one of those kits now with me for years. Right. Just a little quickie kit attaches right there. Oh my gosh, that is so convenient. Uh, yeah. Very just because good point. of what I do for a living, I end up using it about every other week. Oh, yeah. Yeah, you're always uh, bailing people out. But, somebody's car didn't start. Yes. But, yeah, send them off. You know, obviously, they got their books. They got their laptop. They've got all this, The you know, their equipment. F- but don't forget the tools. A few tools, never a bad idea. Because the woodworking skills will last a lifetime. <laughs> Absolutely. Actually, so, <laughs> um, Alan, in a minute, we are gonna get, uh, we're going to get to the great mm-hmm. moments in building history. You're spearheading this discussion. You've been very guarded, and you don't want to... Uh, Give I us have. too much information. And, of course, later in the show, we're going to talk about our must-have item of the week. We've got a few other things. But since I know we're going to get, uh, we're going to get really deep into this mm-hmm. conversation, I don't want to... Um, I don't want to miss the opportunity to talk about our good buddy Larry Brown from Brown Refrigeration because um, I feel like... Um, uh, this... I don't know, Alan. For some reason, when you get to... Uh, we had a little cool-off today. Oh, I woke up today, goodness. and it wasn't sweltering. I actually right. didn't even turn the air conditioning on in my car mm-hmm, and everything. Mm-hmm. And I feel like what happens there is suddenly people go, you know, it's not going to be summer forever. At some point, my my heating... I feel like oh. this is the time of, you know, of year when suddenly he's getting it from both ends. Yes. He's get- <laughs> yes. Larry is here. You know, people are starting to think about their heating system. And they're still dealing with, you know, it is still summer. So, 
Um, Larry's just got to be running, you know, running ragged and everything. But um, if you have any HVAC needs, um, you really can't beat Brown Refrigeration. They're so they're well established. They are a fine tuned, well established machine. And as we learned, Alan, the last time we had Larry Brown in, I didn't realize this is pretty. He's been doing HVAC since he was like ten years old. This is yes. in his blood. His yes. father handed it down. You know, this mm -hmm. is his passion. He, the, you know. It's all about staying on top of the latest technology, making your home as, as, en as energy efficient as it can be, and conditioning the air with all the tools available, including the Remy Halo system. Which and I can't say enough good about that. Oh, that yeah. Is, uh, basically, what that does is it's a UVC light mm -hmm. that removes any type of living organics from your air. Right. That includes viruses, bacteria, just the junk that exists in your house. Up to and including dust mites. Absolutely, mm -hmm. yeah. You know something we we don't always highlight, Alan, because we 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 talk about the Remy Halo system. We talk about uh, the train um, HVAC units that they use. Very very well constructed uh, machines. We talk about the smart home system. Mm -hmm. uh, you can control all this from your phone. You know what we sometimes skip over is the thermostat technology. Oh. Thermostats, you know, in the old days, you you swore you moved the little thing over and you sort of approximate. I'm going to try to get it to 72 degrees or something. Well, now you can get it down to the exact degree. You can it's timers. It's oh. it's it's like its own little uh, computer pad right well, there. Well, you can go onto your phone and go. All right, I'll be home at five. So at five o'clock, I want to drop the temperature from 78 to 72. Right. And that way you didn't. Now we all agree, don't turn off the air because right. then you're messing up the humidity and all that. But Dropping that, changing that temperature the six degrees while you're gone saves you a ton of money, and being good and comfortable when you get home makes you happy to be there. And it's there's few things you can say that literally pay for themselves. And when you have mm. a, a highly efficient, um, modern, updated HVAC system, it really does pay for itself. It's it noticeable does. when you get when you pick up that uh, uh, MLGW bill. You are oh going to see the yes. difference. And um, also. It, like we say, you want to establish a relationship with your HVAC company and you want somebody that's going to be around 10 years from now oh, yes. and that's been around already and knows the uh, ins and outs and can maintain your system. So you can't you can't beat Brown Refrigeration. Uh, Larry, it, they, he's created a great business culture over there. It's a solid, rock solid team and uh, we highly recommend them. So you can call them directly at 901-362-1881 and Pete, somebody will answer that mm -hmm. call. They will. Uh, or you can go to their very easy to remember website, brownref.com. Okay, Alan. Well, we're, th we're we're throwing it to you. It is now my favorite segment of the week. Dun so. dun dun. And now, great moments in building history. <laughs> That's a that guy sounds very sophisticated. I don't, I don't know, know who it is. I don't doing know that voice. Sophisticated was the word I was going to use. But. All right. Well, Alan, you've been very coy. You've I been have, very guarded. I of I am I am I've decided for my my great moment in building history. I'm going to pick one of the things that has made building history possible. Okay. Uh, right. We're, we're going to take one step up from the brick, and I'm going to say the arch. Okay. So now, Alan, are you talking about the arch? Is Just there a type an of arch? Okay. Just so, an arch. So an you're talking arch. about the actual... Uh, is it's it, is a this couple theme? of walls, and it is a curved or V-shaped uh, item above it. Yeah. And this particular shape... Um, has been found as far back as the Bronze Age, Mesopotamia, throughout human history, we've kind of known about it. Mm -hmm. And we've we've more or less used it, but it's not until we get to the Romans, not until we actually get to the military engineering metroplex, if you will, because armies march right. on roads. Yeah. yeah. And... All right. One of the funny, one of the funniest things that ever cracked me up was why are the roads and railway tracks and all that kind of stuff the width that they are, and that is because you go back to Roman times and you measure the width of a chariot, and that's the width of a lane. Is a chariot more or less the same width as our modern cars? Yes. That's interesting. It's you know welcome that's to cool. railway tracks. Yeah. Welcome to welcome to have something that is so legacy, we will never ever ever get rid of it. Now, I'm sorry, I don't want to get sidetracked, but a chariot in the old days, would that have been basically a two-passenger thing? You're standing side-by-side side with whoever, yeah. and 
I, I guess that would be the same wheelspan. Yeah. So, yeah, that's interesting. Yeah, put a couple yeah. of horses out yeah. there. That's, that's why our space shuttle is long and skinny. What yeah. side like, of the road did the Romans drive on back oh, in the day? Yeah. You what? know what? If you were in a hurry, you took that right down the middle. It's a boom. <laughs> oh, so they everybody get out of my way. Well, it's like, you know, yeah. but actually, of uh, by legacy thinking, then it would be the opposite of what we drive over here. So, Alan, I'm curious, though. You know, the, the Roman, Roman art, I mean, okay, well, Roman technology was second to none back in the day, right? Yes. I mean, their building, their their culture, everything they did, was it to aid Roman conquest or was it just because they just liked to build stuff? Did they have that same can-do attitude that our the, the Industrial Revolution people had? So. I, I think depending upon which historian you ask, the answer is going to be yes, yes, and yes. I got you. Of, all right, public works became a big thing for any industrialized and we're going to I'm going to put big air quotes around industrialized or AK any area that became a city. Mm -hmm. Now we think of cities with cars and stuff like that, but you know, in Mesoamerica, we had cities with a million people in them before there were pyramids. Right. Of over in the Middle East, we had huge cities and metroplexes that, you know, if they had enough water, if they had enough sewage, if they had enough, all the things you needed to have a city, you had yeah. a city. Yeah. But the biggest thing you have to have is the infrastructure to have a home and roads. Right. Yeah. And the biggest thing to a road is how do you get from point A to point B when nature is remarkably random? Yeah. So you got a ravine, you got a creek, you got a pond, you got big rocks, you got things in between where humans want to go. Yeah. So here we go. We, we go to this simple idea that was probably stolen from nature. You know, we, we, we've, there's natural arches all throughout natural history. So somebody sat down, and I mean, we're, we're honestly talking 5,000, 6,000, 10,000 years ago. And they went, you know, if we kind of build these walls up straight and we lean these over and we put a stone right in the middle of it, this thing's pretty sturdy. It's ironic because, it, I mean, it's it looks counterintuitive. An arch doesn't even look like it should stand up. I'm sorry. I mean, exactly. It's just, I agree with and you. And yet, the way the pressures work, somebody had the, 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 the presence of mind to figure this out. The physics of them are amazing. Right. Now, here's the shocking part. We still have these buildings from oh, yeah. 3,000 years ago, 4,000 right. years ago still standing is it right to say that the greeks and the romans were kind of on the same you know are we talking about the same well we're going back to the here, egyptians the yeah. mesopotamians we're mm -hmm. talking the exact same engineering okay the arch honestly hasn't changed at all in thousands of years the physics is the physics right now what you made an arch out of has changed and come and gone over over the eons. Yeah, uh, some people use cut stones, some people used bricks, some people used uh, other indigenous materials. But if that material didn't rot on its own for any reason, yeah, because you know you could build. Of uh, I've done a lot of haunted houses and stuff. You can build an arch out of hay. You stack the hay bales up. You lean them over. You put that bay bale in the center. A hay bale arch will stand up. Until the hay actually gives. Well, and, and that's that's the other part of this because there are some um, structures in Rome that are made out of concrete. Some are made out of marble. Oh, and yeah. Well, concrete. One of the things they discovered we've we've discussed this before is that salt water mm. sort of helps you preserve concrete and it makes it much stronger. It 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 you know we're not going to get into the physics of that, right. but it that's why a concrete structure from two thousand years ago is still. Yeah, there, that, that you know. volcanic mortar they were mixing, that stuff has held up for thousands of years. But, Alan, what I was thinking is um, when what's fascinating about the arch to me is so you look at it, you know, it go, you have the walls, which I guess have to right. be fixed, and then they go up, and it, sometimes it's like sort of a pie shape wedge that, right. you know, and then in the center, what do they call it? The capstone? That's or the, the capstone of the keystone. Okay. Right. To me, it seems like I always feel like, okay, one of these stones is probably getting the shorter end of the stick, and at some point, if it gives, everything's going to give, but because of the pressures involved, it's, it's evenly distributed. That is mind blowing, and it's 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 uh, set up in a way where it wants to be, it wants to push together, right? Yes, it's just amazing. I mean, honestly, whoever made the first arch, do we know who that is? No, Alan? no. <laughs> <laughs> 
Uh, it just doesn't look like it should work, and yet it does. So. My question is, is like, were there people back in the day who tried to make something that was like a replacement for the arch because of the fact that they harbor that similar skepticism yeah. about the arch? It's like, this can't possibly work, and yet the physics does. Is there somebody out there or any civilization out there that was like, you know what, we're going to try something different just to be on the safe side? Maybe it's Stonehenge. Uh, well, <laughs> I mean, look at how they did. Yeah, that's sort of the well, pretty you know, straightforward. Yeah. If there was, it probably fell over. So, you know, of uh, you know, until you get into truly modern, what we would consider modern, which is industrial revolution forward. Right. The arch just couldn't be beat. Of the arch enabled us to have uh well, it enabled us to have the entire renaissance because the weight of a castle wall was so great, you couldn't build these elaborate buildings without arched windows. Um, Alan, that, that was going to be one of my questions. I have a little checklist of questions here. So, Alan, I'm thinking, I keep I keep tying in the Greeks and the Romans right. just because I think of Roman They were the theater. ones who really mass-produced this particular shape. Well, one of the things about uh, Greek and Roman culture is they also, okay, they brought us theater. Yes. They brought us the art. They brought us... Um, a culture where they gathered together in large areas mm -hmm. and they wanted to, you know, share experiences. Well, okay, you can't just build, a, you know, it, there's only so big, um, you know, a space you can build right. before it's safe. So they had to come up with some way of making large indoor spaces. And mm -hmm. is that where the arch maybe, where the motivation for the arch came from? Because, I mean, some of these structures, they're, I mean, I'm, 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 I'm just, you know, if you look, if you look at Rome, some of the, uh, is it the uh, the Colosseum? Let's yeah. pick on the Colosseum. Yeah. Uh, it was multiple stories high. Mm -hmm. uh, the weight is distributed by arched ways through the building, so the building itself weighs millions of tons less, right? Because of the fact that it did have the arched uh, doorways, and as you and I were talking last night, you were greatly surprised to find out the Colosseum never fell down. Yeah, there's that big chunk missing. I grew up thinking it fell. It fell down. They it did just not took, fall they down. They took it apart they and stole recycled it. it. Yeah. Right. I they, think there's a pretty cool quote about like I'm a Rome and everything. They said the day that the um, uh, Colosseum collapses is the day that Rome truly falls. So, something like that. Oh, so that's sort of a and, darkly prophetic. So, well, yeah. you know, it wasn't, of, it wasn't until literally somebody began disassembling it. <laughs> that you know, pieces came up missing. Well, the the one I was thinking of, Alan, it's sort of it. It's a dome. What is that big dome in in uh, in Italy? It's still there today. The Pantheon. I, the Pantheon, and it's um, it's basically an outgrowth of the well, arch because I mean that right. thing is huge. You can, that's when we say something has been vaulted, right? And what we are doing there is we're just continuing an arch, right, into a larger, deeper structure. And the amazing thing is so many of those buildings, in spite of earthquakes and weather and, you know, bad storms are nothing new. Right. I know we like to think they're new. They're nothing new. And they get earthquakes in it. And earthquakes and tsunamis and all kinds of crazy, you know, geologic events. A lot of these buildings are still there. And nobody was sitting around on a computer 2,000 years ago calculating out the physics and the weight distribution Imagine the guy sitting there with the string and the glass of water and how they were leveling things. Because we you did we did a salute to glass. Right. And glass begins to play a big part in this, especially when we get to the Renaissance. Right. Because glass weighed so much less than stone and did just as good a job of keeping the outside out and the inside in. And now we get into the modern idea of windows. It lets light in. It, it, yeah, get, exactly. The beautiful in all of the churches all over the world, the beautiful stained glass work are usually contained in arches. Yeah, and it's 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 interesting because what it makes me think, Alan, is is like I said, to look at an arch, I bet you the first arches that went up, people are like, I'm not walking under that thing. It looks like <laughs> it. <laughs> you imagine the first guy going, no, really, it'll hold together. No, really. It makes me uh, wonder did. What, what future design structures are going to be out there and people are like that there's no way that can work and yet so it's well know. we just got through talking about a, a building that right. was using pre-stressed and prefabricated uh building yeah. supplies yeah. and they were kind of waiting on it to fall down and 50 years later it's renovated and people are still living there
Yeah, pretty impressive, man. So, but um, the 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 arch, what wide ranging uh, implications? We, we wouldn't and, be here today without it. No, I don't. I, I think you're right, and and the world would look a lot different without oh, the yeah. arch. So I don't know, man. I feel like we'd be living in. Uh, flat boring uh buildings and stuff <laughs> we'd be joining you from cave talk radio yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well we'll probably have a few wrap-up thoughts about the arch and then alan um we've got uh, of course we've got our must-have item of the week mm -hmm. and uh we got a few little other uh, surprises we're going to be throwing in there you're listening to tool talk radio here at news talk 98.9 the roar of memphis we're going to take a quick break and we'll be right back Tool Talk Radio with Joe and Alan. Everything that has transpired has done so according to my desire. News Talk 98.9, the roar of Memphis. Alan, do you think everything's transpired according to your design today? I mean, we're trying. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we're doing we're doing pretty good. And actually, if it has, I I shudder to think because I, I don't want everything transpiring according <laughs> to your design, Alan. Who knows where we'll go? Anyway, welcome back to uh, Tool Talk Radio, coming to you from the Brown Refrigeration Studios. I'm Joe Thorderson with Thor's Hammer Carpentry and Wood Turning. Here with my buddy Alan Gilbreth from Dark Oak Media uh, and our pal Max over there. Sorry, Alan. DarkOakMedia.com. And our buddy Max over there behind the glass. You can call or text us at the Big M Roofing and Remodeling Hotline at 901-683-0989. And I just want to make a clarification, Alan. Uh, you can text us anytime, mm -hmm. any day of the week and send us a message. I, we were mistaken, though. You can't leave us a voice message in, um, on this line, but you can just call 901-921-7105 and leave a message anytime. There you, you know, go. There, that's how... That's how Becky, you know, let's just be honest. That's my business number, and I'm happy to 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 help the cause. And there so it's go. nice to get voice messages. And if you do, and you have a request, it could be maybe you want to discuss something, maybe you want to learn something, maybe you want to uh, have us hit a topic that we haven't hit. Yeah. Leave us a message there, and like we said, your your requests go to the top of the pile. And you do uh, Joe's favorite game and try to play Stump Allen. Yeah. Ask me a oh, weird question. Yeah. Yeah, Come on. absolutely. So, hey, Alan, um, you, you in our great moments in building history, you were discussing uh, the arch. We were really kind of, you were really zeroing in a lot on the Roman arch design. And I guess we have a few parting thoughts before we move along no, with yeah, that. So, no, yeah. yeah. The, 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 the sheer simplicity of this thing, and but the, the amazing physics that went into it. And, and here's the great thing. Nobody sat around calculating these physics. This was purely observation. So people, honestly, in the second millennium BCE, were sitting around going, you know, we got these mud bricks. We can make a doorway. It looks like this. And the house stays up. Yeah, it's funny you say that, Alan, because I was just sitting there thinking, somebody came up with it first. I'm thinking, okay, maybe they came across a bunch of curved tree limbs or something. And they just made so – and they said, boy, you know – it's actually it's, pretty rigid. This thing, you know, yeah. we had an earthquake and, you know, Bob's house fell down and my house looks great. Right. And yeah. next thing you know, everybody wants an arch. Of The great thing is, is this, this simple little half moon shape, this little, it comes up and gives you a little dome of, is just shockingly stable. Uh, we have suspension bridges. We have spanned amazing and some of the bridges built, especially of turn of the century for us, 1880, 1890, 1900s, mm -hmm. when we were really getting into grand building projects. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Of there are some stupidly big structures that still use the arch sure. that survived. I mean, of the Notre Dame it, Cathedral. I mean, that's, uh, you know. Well, I, you know, I'll, I'll pick on of uh, Memphis has got, uh, welcome to Memphis, Tennessee, ladies and gentlemen. We have two bridges across the oh, Mississippi yeah. River. Yeah. For some strange reason, in spite of the fact the bridge is over 75 years old, we still refer to it as the new bridge. Yeah. Because we is have it a bridge. that old? I didn't know it was that yes, old. So, yes. Okay. It is older. Well, because the old bridge is old. I the mean, old bridge is yeah. even older than the new bridge. Right. So, in spite of the fact of its age, you know, but you look at both of these bridges, and they are still archetype span bridges mm -hmm. with the basic architecture of arches. Right. And they hold up to you. Think about the amount of traffic. 
And then, the, then of course, you know, a relative of mine in England will send me a picture and goes, you know, you think that's fabulous. <laughs> I said, you know, he'll send me right. a picture and he goes, this bridge right here has been in my neighborhood for 1,400 oh, years. Oh, yeah. Yeah, we're, I mean. And we're still using the same bridge with the same cobblestones over the same river. There's that famous bridge in Rome, which I forgot the name of, but it's made up cons <sighs> Strictly of arches, you yes, know? and it's still there. The the soldiers, you know, the Roman invaders rode that. Everybody road. Yeah. has walked, driven, or and you're you're thinking about these bridges were made for carriages and people and walking, mm -hmm. and we're driving trucks across them these days, right? And they're still holding up. Pretty awesome, what, man. A, just what a cornerstone of modern design. That's been around for thousands of years. Well, great moments in building history. Uh, it could, like we said, we've 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 talked about actual structures. We've talked about uh, things like the World's Fair, of, mm. you know, the Great World's uh, Fair of uh, eighteen ninety three. And uh, now Alan brings us the arch. Who knows what next week's topic will be? That's true. But you got to stay tuned to uh, Tool Talk Radio to find out. Well, Alan, uh, we got a couple things in a minute. Uh, we're going to get to our must have item of the week. But I wanted to. I had an observation. Well, it's more of a revelation during mm. um, the commercial break. I'm throwing this at you blind. I'm not. Okay. I didn't give you a heads up, but um, you know how they we talk about lifestyle improvements. Yes. And just um, there's things once you get one, you wondered how you live without it. Well, <laughs> my suggestion is if you have the means. Okay, this does. If you're if you're somebody that owns a pickup truck, this doesn't count. This is sort of because uh, Alan, you know what it's like to own a pickup truck. As long as I've known you, you've had a pickup truck of yes, some correct. sort. You're the guy that gets called to move people's furniture. You're the guy that gets called. You're, you're everybody's best friend on moving day. Or and when they I call will you from be Walt, all afternoon. Yeah, yes, they call sir, you, I will. They call you from the big box store because mm -hmm. they just bought an 82-inch TV or something, and they need to <laughs> ride. Well, Alan, I recently, in the last year, acquired a trailer. It's oh, yeah. a very simple. It's it's five feet by eight foot the bed. Actually, it's a loaner. My buddy Coach, you know the coach right. mm -hmm. over mm -hmm. in uh, West do. Memphis. He loaned me his trailer because, uh, like I said, I have these pallets that I've been uh, right. picking up and stuff. Well, the beauty of a trailer, <laughs> Alan, for one thing, this 5x8 trailer, I keep, you know, uh, I keep it safe, and uh, it's so lightweight, I can actually wheel it around myself. Right. So, in other words, like, if, it, if it's time to use the trailer, um, I can pull it out, and wheel it over to the truck. I, I hook, hook, put my uh, trailer hitch on. Right. And it's amazing the stuff you can haul around with it. But what I like is it's very strong, but it's also really lightweight. And people don't know that I own it. That's or well, well I should say that I now. that I'm in possession of it. <laughs> what I like about that is many people. You might even have a car that has a tow package on it. Right. It's it's pretty exciting and liberating to be able to just move something. On your own and mm -hmm. not pay that delivery charge or just get it when you want it. And um, moving, I don't know, man, it's just the the versatility of it. And they're not that expensive, honestly. You can no. get a you can get a really good trailer for like $1,000 or something yes. like that. Mm -hmm. And um, I think it's a good option to the uh, pickup truck scenario. Because like I said, it's sort of you can, if you have the means or if you have a place to keep it secure. Right. It's a pretty cool thing to have, man. I uh, can't argue with you. I have a very good friend with uh, a nice size trailer. Uh -huh. uh, it makes hauling lumber, sheetrock, and a wide variety of things around very simple. Yeah, because it's big, too. And the thing that's nice about it is most of these, um, you can get to every side of it. So if you've got that, if you've if you got to go pick up 50 two-by-fours or, you know, whatever, mm -hmm. all those bags of sand or something, man, it's it's a great thing to uh, have. So And to be honest, since you mentioned we're, we've been kind of talking about moving your college students. There you if go. If you got a trailer, uh, there are a number of good industrial strength totes mm -hmm. that are very inexpensive, that lock. Right. That you can throw a bungee strap over the top of and you can stack quite a bit of stuff on a trailer and my suggestion is if you've got a couple buddies or if you've got some go in on a trailer each of you kick in a mm -hmm. few hundred bucks and you you could either keep you know if somebody's got like that perfect space to keep it in you guys right. can just share it or something because it's it's just cool it's I, I really never realized how much i would enjoy being able to haul stuff like that so in secret, like I said, nobody knows that. Of course, no, I'm saying yeah, it over yeah, the course. air now. Yeah, nobody knows anymore. <laughs> yeah, nobody knows now. 
But does right. everybody know where you live? Yeah. Well, well probably get, the way Alan does. But they got his does, number so. now. They got his number. Yeah. But anyway, I'm not. it doesn't mean I'm going to be your best friend on moving day. <laughs> but uh, I just wanted to mention that. I've really enjoyed And, Coach, thanks for letting me uh, borrow yeah. your trailer, man. It's not my. Hey, I got it out in this. I can say, hey, I'm sorry. This I is not my trailer. Back. I had to give it back. Or, uh, yeah, I, he has a rule. I can't mm. help you move your couch. <laughs> I've got to just, you know. So, anyway. All well, right. What well, if they just, go to the coach? Yeah. Just a little thing there, Alan. It was a, it was a noticeable lifestyle improvement that um, that I've observed over the last uh, last six months or so. But Alan, it's time to get to our must have item of the week. All right. Uh, I've already posted this, Alan. This is one of these. This is it's a it's, it's amazingly inexpensive. But just tell people what I'm holding up here. You're holding up an indescript little bottle that happens to have the words on it. Isopropyl or rubbing alcohol. Right. Why do they call it rubbing alcohol? I mean, to be honest, I don't know that. But because it's for rubbing. Oh. It's it, not for ingesting it. Right. You're not supposed to drink it. Is it it's for like... use only. What... Okay, and I, I didn't even mean to get sidetracked on this, but what is rubbing alcohol for? Like, is that is that what the gold... Like, the, the boxers in the old days, the, the, the guy would uh, yeah. rub them down with that? Yeah. It sounds painful. It like, is. But, yeah. but it's also... <laughs> what does that do to your skin? I what, mean, it sounds like it would dry it out and... Uh, actually, it is instantly cooling. Oh. Is so that the purpose of it, it? Exactly. That is, if you're trying to get rid of inflammation or a sore spot or something like that, you had this which evaporates very, very rapidly and leaves you with a cool spot. Oh, okay. And if so, you have any cuts, you'll know it Oh, quick. yeah. If you got a little pinprick or something in the skin, you'll know it real fast. Well, the reason I'm mentioning this, Alan, is because I it's amazing how useful rubbing alcohol is. Let's say right out of the gate, use it responsibly. Yes. Don't use this willy-nilly. But in the course of home improvement and working flammable. with tools, yes. I I can't tell you how many how much I use it. For one thing, Alan, um I use it um Maybe you maybe you have something that's got uh, a layer of I don't know gunk or greasy mm -hmm. or something. Rubbing alcohol is a really quick way to dissolve it and clean to clean an item or something like that. You know, do you ever uh, like well, it's got that gluey substance on there that you got to dissolve? I use rubbing alcohol virtually every day on my tools, and I'm going to give you three categories of why. Okay. Uh, one, I work in the medical profession. So oh, when sanitary. you are honestly disinfecting your tools right. as you go from honestly some some places room to room, mm -hmm. so you whatever critter was living in the sink when you go in to fix the sink, you got to clean your tools so you don't take that critter to the next room. Right. Uh, the other one is like on the weekends, I do a lot of exterior work. Yeah. And again, I'm working around animals. Yeah. Dirt, the great outdoors, that kind of stuff. And my tools have a tendency to go indoors quite a bit also. So, again, rub down with the isopropyl alcohol. Yeah. And the third reason is I just don't like gunky, nasty tools. I like nice, clean uh, hand, especially the grips. Right. Of Take the battery off a battery-powered tool before you rub it with anything inflammatory. Right. But where your hand normally goes has a tendency to build up oil grease and other stuff yeah and you know it, it's kind of a safety thing for the tool well it's also that and then um i don't know if this is uh, uh i don't know if chemists out there are screaming at the radios and saying you can't do that but i'm gonna just say in my day-to-day -day life alan if mm -hmm. i had to paint like a kitchen cabinet or something right. and it's got that layer you know it's got years of cooking and stuff that's yes. been going on to get to break down the greasy film or to these other, you know, there's there's that just sticky layer of stuff. Rubbing alcohol is my go-to thing. It's, that's the first thing I reach for after I've got it clean. Of course, I go to my um, my uh, de paint deglosser and everything right. like that. But rubbing alcohol, I've also used it, Alan, to um, remove polyurethane. It's worked. I'm not saying... <laughs> no, I, okay. I had this small section of floor... That uh, it was a hardwood floor, and I had to get it down to bare wood. I, I don't know if this is a, you know, I don't know if this is a kosher, but I did it. I mm. took a bottle of rubbing alcohol, I saturated it, I rubbed it around, and then um, took up the excess and sanded it, and the stuff came right off. I don't know. Is there what's the chemistry behind that? Is that a well? It, again, it's it's that, <laughs> it worked. That's it's all that I know. rapid evaporation, that quick drying. Of, That's what I like. It evaporates, boom, you know. All right, yeah. all right this is a little bit of a cheat okay. that, that I've used in a, of areas where we're working with a lot of uh, ceramic, especially tile. Yeah. Of somebody spills a liquid 
on your tile. The mortar's wet, everything, and you're trying to get work done. So I have re-wiped uh, tile floors with rubbing alcohol as a quickie drying agent. Oh, there you go. So it yeah. gets the, you know, the little water down in the cracks and all that kind of stuff. Well, you wipe it over lightly with uh, a rag coated in uh, isopropyl alcohol, and you get that huge rush as it begins to evaporate. But you'll go back a few minutes later, and six hours worth of water is now evaporated up with the alcohol. Yeah, and I'm glad you mentioned the evaporative effect because that's what I like. I want something that's going to clean this thing. It's going to go. degrease it, and then it's gone in 30 seconds. Right. You know, and it's and uh, I will say you can't saturate wood or something, and it's it still needs it's still a liquid, so it right. has to evaporate. But um, it's what what does a bottle of rubbing alcohol cost? A dollar, two bucks. It's something? very inexpensive. Yeah. My curiosity is who invented it. Uh, no. Rubbing alcohol has been uh, has been around a long time because it's also wood. It's a called a wood grain alcohol. Um, okay, so it is not it is not something you can drink. <laughs> yeah, don't drink the rubbing. Isn't that like? Uh, I mean, actually, though. Um, oh, I know what it was. Everclear. You've heard of that booze, Everclear. Well, yeah, I took a sniff of that. Somebody was. I think. I think our buddy Shorty well, had some of that. That's a PGA. That's a pure grain. And alcohol. it smelled like rubbing alcohol. So yeah. But um. A anyway, rubbing alcohol is a great go-to. Use it safely. Keep in mind the fumes are flammable, right, Alan? So. Oh, that, that's very, very flammable. Of, but you get to go and and your to answer your question, Max. You get to go to the Standard Oil Company. And go back of kind of, again, we're, we're working with the petroleum. And we began discovering all kinds of byproducts. Right. And that's where, again, we get into our modern history and the amount of byproducts that came out of the early 10s and 20s when we were figuring out petroleum. Yeah. But that is where you get your first of um, Rubbing alcohol, synthetic alcohol. Does this also tie hand in hand with a history of like pasteurization and sterilization, like when people are have like sterilizing wounds and stuff? Yeah, well, yes. Of your, again, nothing, nothing exists in a in a vacuum because the minute you come up with one thing, and somebody goes, that is exactly what I needed over here. Or how can we weaponize it? Yeah. yeah well, <laughs> that, that happens too. Of so isopropyl alcohol. Uh, basically was done by uh, taking a propene byproduct and of what we call hydrating it in, in making it a little more of a liquid so it didn't burn your skin. Okay, so that's our must-have item of the week. And it's, you know, sometimes these are uh, out-of-the-box suggestions. However, if you work with tools or if you're in, involved in home improvement, you'd be amazed how these things cross over. So oh, keep, yeah. keep a bottle of uh, rubbing alcohol around. Hey, Max, in a minute, I didn't warn you about this. I have a, I don't know if we're going to call this a critter wars but i guess that's for lack of a better term we're going to call us i feel like this is trying to critter help involvement critters. yes before we get to that though alan um what's going on with darkoakmedia.com because you told me there's some oh, new content out there yeah we got all excited besides just us okay of uh one of the shows we do is called it came from the international market right and that is where unusual foodstuffs for sale at an international market uh get tried by some of my local comedic friends you know um, alan I, I i gotta say though because i always feel like i gotta come to the defense of the international market what you're saying unusual maybe it's unusual to us it's around unusual the world. to us and this it may, may be, be a regular dietary staple for people, well so. it, all right I, I love to pick on like the candies because yeah. there, there's a lot of candies out there that are very well known mm -hmm. we know them however you go to france and that candy company makes the same candy in three other flavors we don't get. Right. Yeah, that's and true. And so you go to international market and suddenly you discovered, I had no idea they made that in pink. I didn't know and you could get roast beef pocky. It, it, <laughs> <laughs> you, sure. You yeah. have no idea the number of pocky flavors out there. It's like over a hundred. Right. So, you know, the different sodas and, you know, a very common in the Philippines, but not a you know, maybe not well known in Memphis. Okay, so you so you got some more of that content going we on. We do. It is absolutely hilarious. Okay. So they can pop over to darkoakmedia.com, click on it came from the international market and see the latest episodes. Okay, and uh, I just want to remind people on my end that if you have any interesting woodworking projects, now, Alan, nobody's asked me to build an arch 
uh, construction. I I'm, guess I'm I've totally done, down. I've done something similar with pergolas where you're working with 45 degree angles, but mm -hmm. never the art. I, I might be challenged to do that. If you have a, if you want an arch in your backyard yeah. uh, or something, any any I'll interesting woodworking project yeah. that uh, is for the outside of your home. Uh, give me a call. You can call me directly at 901-921-7105 or go to my website, thorshomes.com. And uh, also, I want to remind you, if you want to leave us a voicemail any time of the day, I guess, well, they can call me in the middle of the night because I have my phone. The ringer is turned off. So <laughs> Turn it off. It, yeah. With a request for something you'd like us to discuss here on tooltalkradio.com, you can use that number, 901-921-7105. Somebody's calling me right now, Alan. I did, call after the show, please. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> All right. The phone, maybe they'll leave a message. I don't know. Hey, uh, Max, We uh, before we get out of here, uh, I'm, I guess for lack of a better term, we're going to call this a Critter Wars. Um. Oh, there you go. Okay, he's queuing it up. So, uh, never mind, Alan. I don't know where it went. It's a crit. I don't know if this is a critter wars. Uh, we're gonna we're gonna call it giving critters a hand right now. Yeah, this is more along the lines of critter critter kindness. Well, Alan, I'm encountering something, and I I feel like it's worth mentioning because I feel like I could see, as a kid I could see doing this in mm -hmm. this job that I've been at. They have a swimming pool in the back, and I've told you it's almost like its own ecosystem. They they own chickens, they got dogs, cats. They I've seen snakes in this backyard. Mm. I've seen turtles. I've seen frogs. Well, in recent days, um, especially when we had that really massive heat wave, I've been seeing frogs in the swimming pool, right. and I've been rescuing these frogs. It's I've a critter armistice. Out. Yeah, <laughs> they look pretty happy. However, one of my observations is I don't know how they can get out because for one they thing. Can't. There's nothing to there's there's about about mm, eight inches between the surface of the water and the concrete. You know, I'm like, OK, there's no way they can hop out of this. The other thing is, my understanding is that uh, chlorine is not good for their skin. Nope. It might even kill them. And I think this extends to turtles and other reptiles. Mm -hmm. And so if you've got kids and they they catch a frog or something, don't keep them away from the swimming pool yeah, don't that was sort of my thing um, what, what's going on with this if you if they do get chlorine on them because what well, i did I, I just for 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 the record i scooped them out right and i had a little uh bucket and so i had them in the bucket i rinsed them with plain water from okay. the hose and then i set them free so because right. i did i i didn't want that chlorine on their skin so. right uh well you're 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 becoming a very good critter samaritan okay good of, yeah all right the thing is, the, the, the chlorine in your swimming pool is really quite harsh. Sure. So it, it's, it's got to kill It's, it's there to kill stuff, right? right? Yeah. Um, turtles, That's why your eyes snakes, are all red. toads, yeah. things with non-permeable skin, uh, they're going to get along better with the chlorine for a while, but like your toads and stuff, eventually they're going to drown. Well, that because too, yeah. they need they they don't swim all the time. They're not fish, right? Of uh, your frogs have permeable skins, and that chlorine is not doing them any favors. Right, it will eventually kill them. Yeah. So fishing them out, making sure they don't get in the skimmer, you know, this is a, a good thing to do, and put them someplace away from the pool. Okay. What about other creatures that wind up in your pool? Do, are oh there any gosh. creatures that might really like it? And they, oh. uh, now the dogs jump in and out of this pool. Yeah, well, all the, the dog time. can get in and out. Um, right. uh, there are a lot of cases of geese and ducks landing in people's pools right now. And what does that do to them? Uh, how does uh, that it's work? Not, out? It's not. It's not. It's not a good thing for your pool. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Those feathers clean. Yeah. They, up the... Yeah. You hope it's the feathers. Uh, <laughs> let's just say ducks are not very well potty trained. Well, I will say, like I said, this turtle, uh, this frog looked pretty happy. Yeah. Yeah. And and, and, and if you look deeper, pool. it's like no, no, folks, we gotta keep. You an need eye to on come that, out of so. the pool, dude. Yeah. Yeah. And um, you know, it's just you know, play with the critters responsibly, yeah. I guess. So. Now I do. I do love the one of the picture of the bear in the hot tub. That's all I got to say. Yeah, that's, bear in a hot tub is all good, clean fun. So, <laughs> Well, Alan, uh, we hope you've had good, clean fun uh, listening to a Tool Talk radio. But whether you have or not, it's time for us mm. to get out of here. So on behalf of my buddy, Alan Gilbreth, and our pal Max over there behind the glass, I'm Joe Thorderson. Thanks for listening to Tool Talk radio, and we'll see you next week. <laughs>